very glad to be here today and welcome to the second of two sessions that are designed to highlight the importance of climate and disaster risk information in the design of pro-poor resilient infrastructure investments. So like you, my name is Lara Arjan and I'm going to be moderating this session today. And like everybody here, I'm very interested in this topic. Tony Wong, who is the presenter today, and me have worked together on a project uh, known as RICE, or Revitalization of Informal Settlements and Their Environments. And that project is going to be highlighted today uh, in Makassar. That project was in Makassar, Indonesia. I am the Urban Development Specialist, and I work with ADB. Uh, in the Department of Sustainable Development and Climate Change. Today's presentation will have two parts in it. The first part will talk about the types of infrastructure of climate and disaster risk information that is needed to design community infrastructure. And the second part will take us through an exercise where we will together see how we will apply a framework to plan and design um, community infrastructure that is pro poor and resilient. I want to remind you that we will be asking questions in the forum after the presentation, but uh, the Q&A box will be open for everybody to put their questions in. Also, if somebody asks a question that you have asked as well, I would invite you to like that question because then it will make prioritizing that question easier. In addition to the Q&A box, we have other boxes. We have the call box that is open. You can also be interactive and you can chat amongst each other in the comments box. And there is also a feedback box. Now, I would like to, um, before starting, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to um, introduce Tony Wong. Tony Wong is Dr. Tony Wong. He is a professor of sustainable development at the Monash Institute for Sustainable Development, Monash University, Australia. And if you want to know more about him, I invite you to go to his bio in the link. Before starting and handing over to Tony, I would like to um, go through a Mentimeter poll with, um, uh, with, with you. And uh, I think um, the, um, our, our, our facilitators, our technical facilitators are going to put the question on top uh, in front of everybody to see. So the question is, are, what are some examples of community infrastructure that are usually affected by climate-related natural phenomena? So um, it would be good if you can put in your answers and then we will crowdsource them and we will see what you think. To you now. It keeps changing. It's very interesting, the cloud. Hmm. We've got about 23 participants, 25 now, 
I'll just give it a little wet before handing over to Tony. Twenty-seven. Twenty-eight, twenty-nine. You see that people are very enthusiastic about it. But got like, oh, I thought we had well, schools and roads. I guess now, thirty-one. Thirty-two. Oh, it's roads and schools. Hmm. Forty. Oh, this is growing. About 48, I think it's closed now. So, um, yeah, I think we should be closing right now. So, uh, I'm going to hand over to Tony to comment and to start his presentation. Tony, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara, and, and good morning to everyone. Uh, the word cloud is, is a a good indication of how familiar uh, the audience is in relation to what constitute community infrastructure. And, and uh, you know, they are different categories of infrastructure from communal centers like uh, schools and marketplace to connective infrastructure such as bridges and roads to basic small minor infrastructure for drainage uh, and so on. So uh, I'm delighted that uh, in fact, every word that's been posted are in fact uh, accurate in how people think community infrastructures are. And, and on that note, I like to uh, now um, present my uh, presentation and, and to perhaps start with uh, talking about how a community infrastructure uh, could be designed or assessed for their resilience uh, and, and what climate and disaster risk information uh, would be helpful in that design and in assessing and assuring the level of uh, resilience in those infrastructure. No. So I'd like to perhaps... Uh, uh, bring together some very broad statement initially in terms of um, what we really need to take into consideration when looking at uh, strengthening the climate change and disaster resilience of pro-poor programs. Uh, I start with program in that the program in fact involves both a combination of social interventions uh, as well as technical interventions. Some of the social interventions are of course in enabling community participation in the selection and design of those infrastructure. It could be about the broad governance and how they would be operated and maintained. Uh, data, of course, access to data can, will always strengthen the design of programs. And perhaps in, in, in our case, even understanding uh, how we would 
ensure resilience in, in situations where perhaps data is not uh, as widely available uh, in data poor environment. And finance, they are very important sort of social interventions uh, that would underpin what would be a very strong pro-poor program. But the strength of that program in terms of how it can improve the livelihood and protect communities in, in, pro, in urban uh, poor environments uh, relates to infrastructure. You know, resilience, it has two parts to that coin. One part being uh, a social resilience, the capacity of communities to respond uh, to uh, events, hazards, and to recover from them. But they can so much be uh, better off and help if accompanying the social resilience is in fact the infrastructure resilience. And this is where some of the program has really got to look at investment of building infrastructure that is, has a level of robustness and adaptability such that it can collectively promote uh, coping incremental and transform transformational strategies uh, for these programs. The urban poor and elements of risk uh, that defines uh, how we would uh, characterize uh, risk in, in uh, poor communities are really related to the combined factor of uh, three key issues. The first is, of course, the vulnerability. And from a poor, uh, urban poor community, the, the, the factors that influence their vulnerability are plentiful you know, shaped by the multiple deprivation of poverty, uh, the absence of access to safe housing. Quite often, they don't have much of a choice in terms of where they, they, where they settle, where they live. And often, where they settle and where they live are in the most inhospitable environment. All of that contributes to their vulnerability. The inhospitality of the environment that they live in, their inability to access essential services really heightens the exposure uh, of these communities to the hazard. And we, can, we, we really need to understand their exposure uh, to that as well. And finally, of course, exposure to hazards. And the hazards are shaped by a combination of where they live, but also a combination of climate-related factors. Now, as we design pro-poor program, we really need to think about all three elements and think about what are the programs that would reduce their vulnerability. It could be about employment, it could be about affordable housing, uh, and so on and so forth. What is it that we can do to reduce their exposure is another consideration. And that could be to, to try and ensure that they don't live in high, highly exposed uh, areas to, to the type of hazards. And finally, when we look at hazards, we, we actually need to question, what are the interventions that we can introduce to support urban poor such that they, there is a level of mitigation of the impact of those hazards? You know, uh, on, the, on that basis, we accept that this is where they live, this is what their exposure is, but we can actually introduce community infrastructure to mitigate and reduce the type of impact the hazards may have on them. And in fact, this is the topic that I want to start my presentation on in this first part. And that is, what are the climate uh, and disaster risk information that we should really be cognizant of when we're looking at hazards uh, that uh, urban poor communities are exposed to? So I'm starting on the premise that where they live uh, are exposed to significant hazards. How do we design community infrastructure that is able to mitigate the impact of those hazards. And again, I, I make the point that the location of, the, of those community infrastructure is a key determinant in terms of how it can be effective in reducing or mi mitigating the impact of those uh, hazards. The key, the key climate change drivers, climate drivers, if you like, uh, are associated with sea level rises, changing rainfall patterns and magnitudes, rising temperature, and broadly the changing of meteorological patterns that may create more cyclones uh, in, in the environment, creating damaging winds and storm surges that expose community infrastructure to a greater 
operational vulnerability. Now you will find that as I present this talk, I am moving to looking at the vulnerability of the infrastructure itself and its capacity to protect the uh, urban poor. Okay, so the, the notion of operational vulnerability and structural integrity comes into consideration. So the focus of this presentation is really on the planning and design of community infrastructure. Some of those things that you've highlighted in there and the use of climate change and disaster risk information on hazards in ensuring their resilience. And perhaps it's most instructive for the, for the rest of this part of this presentation is to actually understand the relationship between climate and the hazards they cause, and then the relationship between the hazard and the vulnerability of uh, community infrastructure. I'll talk around the context of climate change, but you don't really need to just exclusively think about climate change. You could simply think about climate if that's, if that's what you want to uh, look at. But uh, by encapsulating how climate change can change the, the boundary conditions and the environmental conditions that this community infrastructure uh, are exposed to gives us a very good understanding of what information do we need to need to have, how do we understand the uncertainty of that information and how would we apply that in designing or in assessing the resilience of community infrastructure. So increased global temperature, we all know that this is happening. It's been a topic uh, amongst us for, for a long time now. And there are three key things that could happen with increased global temperature. There's a melting of polar caps and sea ice, increased sea surface temperature that actually tends to expand and therefore also uh, has a significant impact on climate, global climate. And of course, the, the most obvious uh, connection is the increase in heat waves. And in fact, if you look at the data that's available and, and in the discussion paper, you will find reference to this. There are already estimates, depending on what climate models is being used, there are estimates on the increase in heat wave days in Indonesia the increase in temperature, mean annual temperature, the uh, maximum temperature uh, are also available in the Philippines, uh, for example. And depending on which climate model is being used, you'll find that there is significant variability uh, in those estimates. And our assessment of the resilience of infrastructure really need to take into consideration those variability. If you look at the example here with the, mod, the RCP 8.5, the scenario, uh, of, of uh, the highest um, uh, uh, temperature increase, you find that the number of heat waves they say in Indonesia, in fact, could be as much as 350 days a year. That is like almost every day, communities in, uh, in, in Indonesia could be exposed to heat wave conditions. And the work that I've done in the past, looking at slum environments, informal settlements, in fact, we found that the impact on informal settlements are even greater in terms of the frequency and, and severity of heat wave conditions. The combination of increased sea surface temperature and, and uh, the melting of the polar caps and sea ice actually will lead to sea level rises, which is another of the hazards that we need to think about. And again, there are information based on different climate models that provides us with predictions of what sea level rises are. And you can see in this table here that by 2100, the sea level rise could be as much uh, as, as low as 0.44 meters. But if you actually include the effect of melting sea ice and, and the polar caps, uh, sea level rise could be as uh, could be anything from 0.98 meters to 2.5 meters in 2100. And so we need to be able to assess how well our infrastructure can withstand that changing conditions. Uh, we could look at it not at 2100, we could look at 20, maybe 2030, 2050, and you can see in the table here that there are also estimated rates of increase that you can look at in between. And it helps us think about adaptability, how we can even think about adapting our community infrastructure over time by working progressively uh, with, with the type of sea level rise scenarios that you see here. So that's another bit of information that you can have. The combination of sea level rise and changing rainfall patterns can lead to also changes in the frequency and the severity of cyclones, the frequency of damaging winds, floods caused by storm surges, 
And changing rainfall patterns also can impact on a greater variability and intensity of flood conditions. Put simply, our community infrastructure is likely to be exposed to increased flooding uh, uh, that it will need to cope with. To understand the impact of uh, global uh, temperature, sea level rise, changing patterns on floods, uh, we can't simply just read the data and get that interpretation. There is a need for us to translate that information whereby we can translate changes in rainfall patterns and intensities into flood probabilities, into flood impact uh, assessments. And this translation is where you do need to in include technical assistance with you to be able to, to translate that. And I'll give you an example of that in, in this slide here. This is some work that we've done in Makassar for some time. We've got 30 years of rainfall data uh, in Makassar, as you can see on the left of your screen. We analyzed that to come up with what you see in the middle of the screen, which is simply a description of the probabilities of rainfall. It is through our understanding of the probabilities of rainfall that we can say, okay, this is what the one in one year flood could look like. This is what the one in two year, the one in five year, the one in a hundred year. And, and, and so on. But understanding the type of rainfall for those different frequencies in itself still doesn't help us understand what its impact might be on a community. And that's when we move to converting that rainfall into some level of flood inundation information as you see to the right of your screen. And that often involves another model which often we refer to as hydraulic models that converts rainfall uh, into discharge and flows into flood depths based on the terrain of, of the community. So you do need technical assistance to translate that kind of information to enable you to assess and design community infrastructure. Local knowledge becomes very important because it, it is actually local knowledge that will help us get assurance and confidence that how we translate rainfall information into flood information, flood depth information uh, has got to be validated. So working with communities, getting their experience in local floodings during recent events can actually help us validate this translation process. And here's some examples of some floods works that we've done, whereby we happen to be uh, in, the, in the community when this big flood, uh, in fact, it wasn't a big flood, it was a flood that occurs three to four times a year occurred in an informal settlement. You can see from the top left picture how high the flood level got to. And then when the flood we see, we were out there immediately working with the community to understand uh, where is the dominant flow path? How high did the flood water get to? How quickly does the flood water recede? And compare that against our translation uh, approach. And through that, we can then start to understand how the community would respond to flood for the one in one year event, the one in two year, the one in five year and so on. And all of that helps us to get a, a good understanding on what type of community structure is required and what level of serviceability we need to introduce into that to provide a level of uh, flood mitigation for the communities. In terms of water supply, uh, it is also important for us un to understand where how sea level rise can actually impact on the security of our water supply infrastructure. Here's an example of a well. Uh, and with rising sea level, you can find that that well could be exposed to saltwater intrusion and saltwater contamination. And so we need to understand the, the, the location of the well and how vulnerable it is to sea level rise to understand the level of resilience in that, flat water, uh, in that water supply system. Another consideration which I see a lot in, in the work that I do uh, is how flood water can bring pollutants into water supply well. And simply because the water supply well, as shown in this diagram, do not have a high enough wall to prevent wa uh, flood water from being introduced into the well and therefore contaminating the well. Uh, also, when, when you have uh, wells that are close to highly contaminated land, the migration of contaminants through a groundwater system can also impact on the quality of water in that well and therefore 
can impact on the serviceability of that particular community infrastructure. So you can see that uh, our understanding of rainfall ability to translate their rainfall into flood uh, conditions in terms of depth uh, and duration of inundation helps us understand and assess the resilience of such community infrastructure. Of course, changing rainfall patterns uh, would mean can also lead to increased incidence of drought, which is another hazard that many of our uh, uh, communities would be exposed to. Uh, in my travels, the, the urban poor, in fact, is exposed to the most vulnerable uh, in terms of water supply security. In fact, uh, if you look at the amount of money they pay for drinking water, it far exceeds the, what the, the growing middle class and the rest of the community pay simply because the urban poor do not have access to reticulated water supply. And therefore, they are more vulnerable to drought conditions because there is not a buffer associated with a more regional water supply systems. So in understanding that, it actually helps us to also understand the uh, resilience of urban poor to drought conditions. Uh, again, it requires a level of translation. How we translate rainfall and high temperature or growing dryness in our catchments, how do we translate that information into a drought security? And there are global informations around that you can have access to actually do that translation. Uh, and again, there are probability curves that were derived for Indonesia and for the Philippines that gives us an understanding of the range and variability uh, of future drought conditions. Uh, and, and so we can take that information in to assess uh, the vulnerability of our infrastructure. And then there's a whole bunch of other things that we find that we know there's a connection, but perhaps do not have as much understanding of the, the direct relationship. For instance, a combination of heat wave and drought conditions can often increase the occurrence of uh, fires, wildfires. Uh, and that is now becoming a, a significant hazard to our communities. Uh, location becomes important in terms of the exposure of urban poor to wildfire. But there is a connection between uh, increased global temperature, increased dryness in our catchments that actually increase the, uh, the, the exposure and vulnerability to wildfires. And of course, increasing higher intensity rainfall, floods, greater frequency of that can also trigger landslides. And so we can actually look at the, uh, an account for increase in flooding conditions, flooding conditions, intensity of rainfall, and actually make an assessment as to how increased vulnerability to landslide could occur as a result of that. So what, what you see in this diagram in here and all the words that are in red, in fact, highlights all the potential hazards that community infrastructure are exposed to heat waves, sea level rises, damaging winds and floods, droughts, landslides, wildfires. Uh, and, and I will now, uh, in the next part, talk about how we can actually assess the impact, the combined effect of these hazards uh, in assessing our uh, community infrastructure. Oh, back to you, Lara. I'm just trying to figure out whether we have time for the pop quiz. I'd like to do it. So I think we wanted to quiz people um, after this presentation. So um, we're going to go back to Mentimeter and we'll try to make it quicker than actually uh, um, anticipated, just to make up for the time. Um, sorry, Tony, it's extremely interesting and there's a lot to say. So um, I'm sure that we'll be able to figure it out. So the first question is, which of the following community infrastructure is rendered uh, vulnerable by wildflowers, uh, fires, sorry. <laughs> so we have community access roads, uh, flood walls and levees. Uh, we also have community schools, or groundwater abstraction. Um, 
sorts of better for lag. So I'm not seeing but only three, four participants now. We're shutting down in 30 seconds, I believe. We have nine, 11. Let's see how much we get before we shut up. It's an easy question, come on. Three, two, one. And the answer is we had 18 participants and we had equal for community access roads and community schools, which is very interesting. But the right question, the, the right answer was the community schools. So let's go to the next question, the quiz. So the next question is which of the following community infrastructure are not rendered vulnerable by floods? Not rendered vulnerable. Let's see. So our, our, our answers are community-based sewage system, dwelling cyclone proofing, flood walls and levees, and non-conventional energy production. We have about 41 seconds. Three, two, one, and let's see the answers. So mostly non-conventional energy production, but it was the dwelling cycle improving. So let us move to the next question. So the next question, and that's the third question, the last one is, which of the following community infrastructure are rendered vulnerable by heat waves? Groundwater abstraction, marketplace, community access roads, or community telephone? We have about one minute to answer. So drum roll, time's up, let's see. So groundwater abstraction, but in fact it was, not the most answers, but in fact it was marketplace. So uh, we will move to the next um, and get Tony on right now to continue his second part of his presentation. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you for your uh, contribution uh, to, to that. I will now share my screen again. And um, <clears throat> what you see uh, in, in the question relates to this, and you will get a copy of this in the sense that in, in some sense, the correct answer is very context specific, and so don't be don't be uh, um, concerned about you not being able to pick the answer. In fact, you may find that all of these climate sense hazards uh, may have a relevance and, and influence in one form or another 
to the community uh, infrastructure that you have in terms of wildfire, floods, and heat wave. But this is sort of typically what we think uh, would occur. Uh, floods do influence a lot of our community infrastructure. Uh, but uh, don't be don't be too concerned if you if you don't get it right. The, the key thing is for for you to actually understand that uh, most community infrastructure are affected by multiple hazards, and and it is really in that context that I want to now talk about how you would use climate and disaster risk information in planning and assessing the hazard resilience of community infrastructure. And again, when we look at community infrastructure, we could use the same structure and framework of vulnerability, exposure, and hazards of the community infrastructure itself, whereby now the vulnerability of community infrastructure to the hazards may be related to the quality of construction, perhaps the design structural integrity of, of those infrastructure. The exposure, of course, is related to where that infrastructure is located, but it is also related to the design standards and the serviceability requirements uh, of that infrastructure. And of course, there's not much that we can actually do about hazards other than to understand what influence those hazards and how do we actually design to accommodate and mitigate those hazards. So I, the, the framework that I'd like to talk to you about looks a bit like that. And, and don't, don't again be concerned about it being terribly daunting, other than that nowadays we, uh, the, the design communities are really moving towards a scenario-based resilient, resilient planning and assessment framework in the sense that uh, statistics are fine, but we really don't understand the future statistics of these hazards. And we also don't understand how they combine. And so we're moving into what we call scenario planning, whereby there could be any number of potential climate sensitive hazards and disaster. We need to be able to uh, consider and perhaps develop a, a suite of potential climate change scenarios or disaster scenarios that looks at the combination of these effects. And for each of those scenarios, we need to assess the implications and the impact of our community infrastructure and basically test as to whether our community infrastructure can withstand or can maintain a level of service to the community under those conditions. And this is what I'd like to go through uh, with you. And I'll give you an example, a real example of a project that Lara has mentioned before, which was some work that I was involved in, in uh, looking at revitalizing and improving basic services to informal settlements in the city of Makassar. In the informal settlement of Batua, uh, we find that those communities live in really difficult conditions, no sanitation services, no good access to water supply, but constantly also having to deal with flooding. As you can see in the diagram in here, very low line. What they do in the floods is to have really sort of really dangerous access to their homes in any combinations of, you know, tree bamboo uh, walkways that they have. They have little rafters and sometimes they just have to wade through that water. Now you got to remember that this water is also contaminated water because the area has no sanitation. And the amount of diseases uh, that the community is exposed to because of that living conditions was considered really unacceptable and it was something that we needed to do about it. And to do that, we would devise a way of uh, building a flood safe access way and in that access way actually build a uh, wastewater treatment facility through the introduction of nature-based solutions. But before we did that, we basically wanted to understand, well, what are the various climate scenarios that we need to assess the resilience of this access way, this roadway? As you can see in my diagram, you've got community access road, community-based sewage system. You can see that the, the issues of sea level rise, storm surges associated with cyclones, and floods are in fact significant uh, climate sensitive hazards. So we thought we'll look into that. And so these are the three uh, types of different scenarios that uh, we need to look at. And, and through that, we are able to then collect and build up a range, um, a, a number of plausible scenarios. For instance, we are able to access information on sea level rise. 
and understand what would be the sea level rise in 2020, 2050, 2070, and 2100. In terms of floods, uh, the advice that we got was that uh, with future climate change, there will be more intense sub-daily extreme rainfall conditions that climate change could amplify coastal flood risk from 19 to 37%. So we make an account and made an estimate of what uh, future rainfall conditions could do in terms of increasing the flood vulnerability of that community. We then also looked at cyclones to say, well, the modeling suggests that in fact, uh, cyclone intensity and frequency across the whole region uh, points to a trend of reduced cyclone frequency, but increase intensity, um, and therefore the frequency of, of, of many of those extreme events. So it, you could infer that the number of cyclones might in fact be the same or less, but the severity of that cyclone is actually higher in, in future. So on that, uh, we have created the scenario. And the next thing that we would do is to select what we call this desired level of service. May, many community infrastructure for the urban poor are often set at a level that balances the issue of costs of the infrastructure to the level of service that the infrastructure can provide. So unlike your major freeway in your city, which may be designed for the 100 year event or even larger, you, may, you often find that access road in community infrastructure are designed to a much lower standard. Uh, it will be a level of service that basically alleviate the day-to-day -day difficulties that those communities are exposed to. And, and so the example that I like to give in this is that we considered, for instance, in this flood safe access way and roads, uh, that if we set it at a level whereby it will be exceeded by flood once every three months, uh, we can then say that, well, that might strike a right balance between the cost of building the access road, uh, but not too high uh, uh, in, in relation to the frequency that access is being disrupted. We did a further analysis that in fact showed that even if that access road was inundated by say 200 millimeters, that you can, and, and if the velocity is quite low, that you can still have safe access even though it's inundated. And it went to show that in fact, on that basis, the level of serviceability could be a one in one year situation that one day or two days a year, a year access is disrupted. But for all the other time of the year, you can actually have safe access to your dwellings. So you find the infrastructure typically designed for the one in three months or one in one year will have a serviceability of 95 to 99% of the time. And for the urban poor, that actually helps alleviate a lot of their difficulties without this infrastructure costing uh, too, too, being too expensive. So having done that, we then actually did an analysis on, well, given the rainfall, uh, what would be the flood levels that we need to design our excess road for? We did an analysis, which I won't go through, that led to that simple graph that you see to the right of the diagram. The simple graph simply looks at the probability that flood level is being exceeded against the flood level on the vertical axis. So at the moment, the ground level uh, or, or the, 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 the level that the community is exposed to, there is at least 21 days a year that the community is cut off from their dwellings. Access is not possible, 21 days a year. And when we did the analysis, we worked out that the 12.6 uh, uh, meters, if we were to set the, uh, build an access road that is a meter high, we find that we reduce that level of disruption uh, to about four days a year. But as you recall, I did say that safe traffic access is in fact allowed the access way to be inundated, but not by more than 0.2 meters and that safe traffic access, in fact, uh, is reduced down to about two days a year. So you find that in that consideration, based on 33 years of data, we were able to select what might be a good design standard of 12.6 meters, uh, which will then reduce the level of disruption from 21 days a year to about two days a year. So that's how you set uh, 
uh, uh, design standards. And this is what we finished building in the sense that this was an access road uh, that uh, as you can see to the right, then we built a constructed wetlands on that access road that provides sanitation, uh, safe sanitation services. But now the access road provides flood safe access to those dwellings by the community. So when we look at our scenario planning, then we can say, okay, let's assess the impact on the infrastructure serviceability as a result of climate change. Same diagram in here, and we want to look at the effect of climate change on floods. Oh, by the way, if you look at the picture to the right, that is a flood situation that occurred recently, inundation whereby water is over the road, but you can see that people can still have safe access because the water inundation is less than 200 millimeters. Now with climate change that increased floods, you find that this design curve that you see here will actually start to shift to the right because of climate change. And we can assess that and say, well, with climate change, the number of days of service interruption would increase from two days to seven days. So you can see that there is now a reduction in serviceability and you need to think about whether that reduction is acceptable or not. And that's where the framework comes in. You say, is the impact acceptable? If it is, that's fine. We can then go and look at another scenario to test it. But if it is not acceptable, then we have to ask the question, can we upgrade the infrastructure, lift it higher? And if we can, then of course we would update the infrastructure and then test a different climate change scenario. But some of the other climate change scenarios that we could test, for instance, is sea level rise. Same curve as you can see in here. And this time the sea level rise, we tested against a one meter sea level rise and the flood curve would increase vertically. And now you find that the level of disruption has increased from two days to 15 days. And if you can compare another scenario to say, what about sea level rise and increased flooding, increased rainfall, and what that does is that it will then start to move that across as well. And this time it would increase the level of disruption from two days to 19, 19 days. And all of this can be assessed according to that framework. And finally, when you look at cyclones, remember we say that the number of cyclone days in fact hasn't changed, but the intensity might be higher. But the reality is that during a cyclone, this whole access is completely flooded. And so the number of current events and future events that this whole disruption would occur, in fact, remains the same. It is up at this end of the design curve, if you like, well above the design standard. And therefore, the ensuring the structural integrity of this accessway becomes the primary conditions, not about disruption, but ensuring that after a cyclone, it comes back to operation quickly. And that becomes the measure of resilience. And there's other things that we can do in terms of building social resilience uh, and, and looking at further investments as climate change occurs all come into this uh, scenario planning framework. But in conclusion, how you look at uh, uh, using climate data to assess the resilience of our infrastructure, first of all, is about the selection of desired level of service. And we talk about this whole question of serviceability and balancing that up with investment. We also found that when we look at the impact of climate change on sea level rise and floods, these are the results of the impact. From sea level rise, it would increase uh, uh, service disruption from two to 15 days. From just rainfall, more intense rainfall, it increased the disruption from two to seven days. If you compare, combine sea level, Sea level rise with flooding, it increases the level of uh, disruption from two to 19 days. And from a, a cyclone perspective, it doesn't change the level of serviceability, but what we need to test is to ensure that the vulnerability or the level of structural integrity of your infrastructure can withstand that and therefore come back into operation immediately after a, a cyclone events. So that is sort of a broad description, if you like, of how you can use the climate information, use the type of technical translation into information that you can use in assessing the community infrastructure, and then use a scenario planning framework 
to actually assess uh, the climate resilience. That same work can also be used for you to decide what is the level of service, what is the design standard for those community infrastructure. Uh, back to you, Lara. Thank you very much. That was extremely interesting, I find. And it's very interesting how we use data to model scenarios of different different scenarios and figure out what design standard we need to give the urban poor. And I also found it very interesting what you mentioned about the balance between the cost and the servability and, 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 and how that is interacting with each other and how as a project officer or somebody who is responsible for building infrastructure, you need to be figuring this out and putting it in because at the end of the day, cost plays a very big, I think, um, factor in the decision of many of our decision makers in municipal governments and in national governments. Um, I, I find it very um, also interesting um, in terms of the, um, this, the, the model we used about vulnerability and exposure and hazards. So um, I, I think that it's very, um, very important to assess the hazards, but instead of choosing one hazard or another, uh, over another or just sort of doing very limited hazard analysis, how they are, this data is out there, Tony, and we can all go and, and get it to better um, assess hazards and look at different scenarios. Um, so I, I, from, you know, the most doom and gloom scenario to the most optimistic scenario, hoping that reality would probably be in, in the middle so I, I, I definitely think that these tools are very important and I'm hoping that they're accessible to everybody from um, city builders who are working at municipal government in developing countries to MDBs, to people in academia. And I think perhaps the biggest challenge is kind of simplifying this access and training people up um, the other thing that I think was very interesting and was very close to my heart was how we tapped into community knowledge to calibrate the modeling. And I think that's very important to do, especially that we're talking about community infrastructure. So if I recall well in the RISE project, we made sure that community had ownership of that infrastructure. It was their infrastructure. They were helping to design that infrastructure. So I think that's something um, very interesting and important for project officers to think of. Because usually we think of this type of participation sort of the last, they don't have much to contribute, they won't understand the science behind it. So I think um, that for me was a very big aspect that came out of your presentation. Um, now I'm going to go to the, the questions um, that were submitted in um, the, uh, the, the, the box. So um, our first question, um, and it had many people repeated that question as well, was how, are, how is this global information and trends translated down to community level? Is it reliable? Does it, does it, does it kind of lose its real, reliability when it goes from this big massive level down all the way down to the community level? Um, yes. So I'm posing it to you, Tony, and Oh, Tell us what you think. No, uh, and absolutely, uh, reliability is, 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 is the key issue in here. But let, let me start from a very basic, that there are well-established techniques in engineering uh, that is able to convert uh, rainfall or wind or whatever into a flood level. The, the difficulty we have here is that the impact of climate change on rainfall is still at a level of uncertainty. And, and so the, the uncertainty actually carries and magnify as we go from one step to another, from rainfall to understanding its, its distribution to then understanding its flood behavior to, under, to then compute the flood height, which is what we use in designing our infrastructure. That has 
uh, that as we go from one step to another, that increases the uncertainty. And, and that's why the current thinking for all of us is to not be too hung up now on the probability because the probability is highly uncertain. It is to basically test under different scenarios whether your, in, your infrastructure can maintain its operational serviceability. So, you know, the, and it is because we, we, we are more uncertain about the reliability, we do the best we can. So when you look at scale, we know that at a global scale, this is what the global climate is doing. We try and translate that to a local scale, which is where we're doing our design. And in that translation, we are getting more and more uncertain, even though we're using quite well-established scientific and engineering techniques to do so. And that's why you know, we, uh, I am very skeptical if someone say that they have now got a future one in a hundred year flood, because we don't actually know what the probability is, but we do need to know that when that occurs, how well does our infrastructure survive that event? Even if it is rendered inoperable during the event, will it come back to operation quickly enough? And what is the impact on the community? So when we survey the community and we say, you're currently having to wade through water on average 21 days in a year. What if we change that to just two days a year? They say that, yes, we, can, we have our own social resilience to accommodate a two day a year lack of access, but it, the, the reduce from 21 days to day, two days increase our livelihood significantly and our exposure to health problem significantly. So that's how we, that's how we have to deal with the uh, uh, future risks of disasters because we can't just rely on straight engineering statistical analysis. Right. Uh, I have, um, there is another question. I think there's a lot of interest in how to make this local. So the other question we got um, many people also asked this question was, what is your general advice that you would give at a municipal level or as they're called in the Philippines, um, LGUs, local government units, in building community infrastructure so that they become more resilient? Yes. So as a policy position, I think government needs to adopt a policy that every infrastructure investment that they do must be tested against a range of potential future hazards and to get a better understanding of their resilience and their adaptability. It is really important for us to know, to be sure that when we build an infrastructure today based on the cost that we have, we need to make sure that they are future-proof by being adaptable, that we can increase their, their serviceability in future. But as a government policy, bringing resilience into consideration is the first thing. Government need technical assistance and, and they need technical assistance to convert basic climate information into real information, whether it is floods or reduce in drought or whatever, you need technical assistance to do that. But when you specify and scope those technical assistance, you should scope that they should be able to use, a, use whatever complicated model they have, but be able to convert back to a simple design curve as I've shown. You can see in the example I gave that we, I went through a very convoluted detailed analysis of very complex that people don't understand and then convert it into a simple curve that people understand, community understands. And then when you test the different scenarios, they become very intuitive for government and for community. So you cannot avoid technical assistance, but the way you specify your requirement has got to be on the basis that after the detailed rigorous analysis, you need to be able to translate that into simple, understandable form that community and government can understand. So I think um, we have more questions. We in fact have another three questions, but I understand Tony that you will be able to answer them in the box uh, later on. So um, yes, I, I, I think, Sorry, make, go ahead. I make the commitment that all questions will be answered within 24 hours. Okay, so uh, thank you, Tony, for that. Um, I'm just going to wrap up right now, and I'm just going to leave everybody here uh, with one thought that was um, 
was shared with me in another forum that made me think, and I think I'm going to repeat this. Um, there are predictions that say that in 30 years, 1.3, there will be a sea level rise of 1.3 meters. I mean, there are different numbers out there. You, you mentioned the 2100 also. In a lifetime of an urban planner or a city builder, we plan for 30 years or 50 years. This is going to happen in our lifetime. And whatever we do now, whatever we plan now, whatever we build now, will be tested in 30 years. When I think of that, that for me is a massive burden in terms of the responsibility that we have on our, on our shoulders. And it's not someone else. We are the ones making this policy and we are the ones implementing the science that the scientists and technologists are finding. So I'm just going to leave you with this thought. I don't mean to make people be pessimistic or to give them a big burden, but I just think that, you know what? It's us, it's here, it's now, and it's happening. So I just want to leave my colleagues with these, these, few, with, with these few thoughts. Uh, the tools are out there. We have people like Tony working on those tools. It's up to us to adopt them and promote them. So thank you very much to everybody. And I will leave everybody to have their lunch right now. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank and you. thank you for the whole team who worked on this and for the people attending. Thank you very much. Thank you.